All right. All right, that seems to be working there. All right, hello. Looks like a couple people are logging on and joining us. Uh, if anybody can say something, just let me know you can hear me and see me, that'd be awesome. You're live. I can hear. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Mark. All right. So uh, we we're having a couple uh, couple technical diff difficulties with that original link sent out. So uh, we just put that up in the chat. We're going to try to switch this over here. But um, like I said we'll give it a little bit of time before we get things going and get involved. So uh, in the meantime, uh, like I said, for those of you that are tuned in, again, first off, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and secondly, thank you very much for the support over the last year. Uh, it's been a very, very odd one for everyone involved, for sure, no doubt. Um, so it's um, very, very appreciated um, by all of us here at TCO. Uh, all of you guys, really, our customers are what made this all work. Um, and so here's to 2021 being a little bit better than 2020 was, for sure, for everybody. Um, but again, thank you very much for your continued support of TCO over the years. I appreciate it. Uh, and everyone at the shop certainly appreciates it as well. So really what we wanted to do today was, um, you know, obviously we all love the Edison show, you know, Somerset Edison. Uh, I was, I've been super lucky, you know, I've worked for TCO for over a decade now. Uh, so I've been bumbling around those shows for, you know, 10, 11, 12 years, um, and it's been uh, a lot of fun. I've met a ton of great people, uh, customers, other folks from the industry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, over the years. So it's it's really been a lot of a lot of fun and really a special thing. But this year, unfortunately, we can't be together doing that stuff. We're not out there, uh, you know, checking out new products, saying hey to everybody, and uh, you know, drinking a bunch of beer. So we wanted to try to bring the show to you, obviously, the customer. Um, a lot of people use the show as an opportunity to see new products, um, you know, talk about new rods hitting the market, new lines, reels, you know, flies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we wanted to create an opportunity here uh, where people can ask and we can talk about new product, uh, things that maybe you haven't been into the shop in a while. Maybe you haven't, um, you know, seen what's new and exciting out there in the industry. So that's what we wanted to do here was to create a platform where, you can, you know, uh, ask questions, and hopefully, I can come up with some good answers for, for you folks. So, again, uh, just as we're letting a couple more people hopefully trickle on in here, just wanted to give it some time before we get rolling. Uh, in the meantime, I did get a list of some customer, or excuse me, some questions from some other customers already. Um, and so, until I start hearing from some folks, I figured I would uh, maybe go through some of these. So, Lenny, looking so fresh and clean. Thank you, Neil. Yeah, as many of you know, I usually have very long hair. I finally decided to chop her off and, and get cleaned up here. So, I am shorn, as I've been told. Uh, so, let's see here. Questions. If my computer decides to load. Uh, right. So almost respectable. Exactly, Jason. Uh, so, uh, first question, um, what's new and exciting from the world in the world of Sims? Uh, looks like Dave in Mountain Union sent that in. So thank you very much, Dave. So there's a lot going on with Sims right now. Um, couple exciting new waders hitting the market. Uh, Sims is coming out with two new pieces this year. First and foremost is going to be the new Sims guide waiter. Um, many of you may remember years ago, uh, Sims always ran a, a guide specific series, 
Uh, and really, it was all about cut and about fit there. Um, so the guide waders and guide jack were on average cut a little roomier, uh, gave you a little bit more room to layer underneath, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, if you're a really big athletic guy, you know, maybe you've got really big legs, uh, thick calves, thick thighs, sometimes G3s uh, or other Sims waders can be a little too tight in the legs for people. So the guide wader is a perfect example of, uh, you know, taking the same technology, same materials, the same Gore-Tex used in the G3 series and the G4, but bringing it uh, to a little bit different cut and a little bit lower price point. So that's going to be a really uh, nice new waiter. Again, U.S. made Gore-Tex waiter coming out. So keep your eyes open for that guy. And the really exciting new waiter uh, from Sims this year is going to be the flyweight waiter. Uh, so it's going to be the lightest weight waiter that Sims has ever made. Uh, it is a Gore-Tex waiter built in the U.S. as always um, for any of the Sims higher end stuff. But uh, it's unique in the sense that it has um, a couple new types of Gore-Tex laminates in it. So um, this time, Sims is actually trying a stretchy Gore-Tex. Uh, it's, a, it's a four-way stretch fabric. Uh, it's not going to be throughout the entire waiter. It's primarily down in the crotch section of the waiter. Um, but it gives you a really, really nice bit of range of motion. Uh, ideally, we're looking to, to get a little bit better durability out of them as well uh, with those pieces, uh, like I said, being able to move. Uh, absolutely, I am history. Uh, you can ask flyline questions, tippet rings, snaps, whatever you want to talk about. We're here. Uh, Bill Harz, good to see you, Bill. What's your uh, favorite all-around four-weight floating fly line? A um, couple different choices out there. Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with what rod you're going to put it on, so a faster action rod versus a, a slower action rod. Um, the most popular lines we sell in the store, I would say the Scientific Anglers Infinity is certainly up there. We sell a lot of those guys. That's a half-line size heavy. Um, so with a lot of faster rods, it'll load up a little bit more efficiently, a little bit easier, and then some kind of up-close shots. Uh, but it's got a really nice kind of versatile all-around taper. So you get some delicacy and some power at distances as well. So the Infinity from Scientific Anglers is a great choice. Uh, the standard Trout taper from Orvis is also a very nice choice. And I'd probably round that out with my third choice being the Rio Gold. Um, all of them are pretty similar. They'll have their slight differences here and there. But uh, all four of those are really, really strong choices. I, again, to answer your question, Bill, a lot of it comes down to the individual rod. Um, so that's what we're here for. Like I said, if you have a particular stick, you want to ask a question, let me know. Uh, but as I was saying before, again, to I am history, uh, if you have timid questions, let me know and we'll go from there. Um, speaking of fly lines, there's actually some really cool new stuff on the market right now. Uh, Rio has just completed a pretty large, um, you know, quite frankly, they, they, they've done a, a pretty large uh, rebuild uh, of a number of their lines and actually tipping leaders right now they're working on as well. So keep an eye out for some cool new stuff from Rio. But uh, they now have two tiers of line uh, as opposed to just the standard, uh, you know, Rio stuff they've always had. Right now, they're going to come out with a premier series uh, and an elite series. The elite will be kind of the best of the best, all of their high end technologies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of choices there. And we just got in a nice solid shipment of a lot of the new Flats Pro lines as well from Rio. So uh, we've got the, the Elite Bonefish, Elite Permit, Elite Flats Pro, and a couple others in there. So if you're curious about that, uh, for sure. Uh, the SA Air Cell line, it's inexpensive, fits my budget, but is there a good eight weight for Sam River Bass carp size fish? Uh, yes and no. So the Air Cell is certainly a, a little bit more affordable line, but for the price, it's definitely going to get you out there and get you fishing and, and get the job done. The main question comes down to, you know, is their eight weight good for the Sand River Bass Carp? There's some variability there. Um, so if you're going to be going to the Salmon River, say right now, obviously we have a lot of customers that are still steelhead fishing uh, up there in Pulaski. If you're going to be fishing in super, super cold water, you might want a different line if you're going to be, than if you'd be fishing uh, in, in super warm weather. So typically speaking, fly lines are sold as either a cold water line or a warm water line. For your bass and carp, you know, middle of the summer, 85 degree day, a warm water line might be a little bit better option. Um, and for, again, steelheading or, you know, a little bit later season salmon stuff in Pulaski, again, you probably want a cold water line there. But, you know, bang for your buck, uh, something that fits that budget, absolutely the air cells are, uh, are, are quite, quite decent for, for what they are, no doubt about that. Uh, James Wilson, TMCO hooks do seem to be scarce right now for sure. Um, I have not a clue, unfortunately, when we're supposed to be getting more stuff. We have been getting inventory trickling in here and there. Uh, so it really depends on exactly what you're looking for. 
Um, really just your best bet is probably give us a call at the shop and see if we can uh, kind of go through and see what we're looking for. Um, but some things are unfortunately backed up. A lot of that just has to do with the supply chain over in Japan where that stuff's being produced and, and, and shipped here. Uh, I'm history. Tibbet snaps for easy fly changes. Absolutely. So Tibbet snaps, uh, I completely agree. I don't use them uh, on any type of really, I would say, general trout flies. So nymphs, dry flies, wet flies, things of that nature. Um, I really think they kind of shine more so in that like six, uh, maybe down to a size eight on the smaller side. You know, really, it, it's kind of a streamer thing, uh, is typically speaking where those snaps work for, for sure uh, the best. I mean, even Rio makes those tiny little twistable clip snaps uh, and they are quite small and they do again, work very well for streamers, but uh, really anytime you're getting into the realm of nymphs or dry flies, it, it might be a little bit too big for most of what you're talking about. Like I said, you're, you're pretty spot on the money. The 18s definitely going to be smaller than the snap. Most situations for sure. Let's see here. Any other questions for now? I guess I'll go back to, let me go find my list of pre-made questions. All right. Let's see here. I'm trying some Allen hooks for egg patterns at the moment. Never tried that one before. Do you have an opinion on them? I don't. Um, well, I, I guess I do. I don't have necessarily the highest opinion of them. Uh, some of their hooks, I have not used them very much myself. Um, I've had a number of friends and, and a number of our customers have brought them in and used them. And I've heard some conflicting reports. Uh, some people seem to think that they're great, especially for the price. There's no question about that. They're quite affordable. Um, but at the same time, you know, I've, I've heard of a couple suspect hooks breaking, hooks opening up, things like that. So Generally speaking, my thinking when it comes to most any type of equipment in fly fishing is, you know, it's a gear sport. There's a certain level of you get what you pay for, depending upon what, what you're talking about. But um, the two places where I always, always, always try to convince people that you should not skimp is going to be your tippet and your hooks. Um, there's a lot of, you know, I, I think there's a lot of different options out there where, Yes, you can save some money on a fly line like the air cell, like we talked about. You can save some money on your rods, your reels, boots, waders, et cetera. But at the end of the day, the really the the most important thing that's connecting you to the the, the fish, obviously, is that hook and that tippet. So if you can find a little bit of room in your budget, you know, I would always recommend save money elsewhere and, and try to get some pretty quality stuff as far as hooks and as far as tippet. Uh, let's see what's happening with Loomis. I love my NRX and thinking of a new rod for smallmouth. Great question there, Jason. So uh, a lot of different options out there for sure. Loomis, uh, has really, really been, uh, been doing some great stuff in the last couple of years that you've seen a, a major rebirth and regrowth in the brand. So really cool, really exciting stuff. Um, right now, primarily with Loomis, you're looking at uh, three different options as far as a smallmouth rod. Typically speaking in our area, we're fishing a six to seven, maybe an eight weight. Um, so you've got really, you're going to start with the G Loomis IMX pro series. Uh, so it's a U.S. built rod. They're going to come in just over 500 bucks. Uh, they make a number of different size options. Uh, and the cool thing about the IMX series is they are really built almost specifically to fish streamers, uh, and poppers, the things that we're doing for bass. So they have a nine foot six weight. They have a nine and a half foot six weight. They'd be really nice for your smaller bass that, that nine and a half. I, I love, I have that rod for waiting. Um, and then when you start looking at, uh, the little bit larger sizes, you'll have your nine, nine foot seven uh, and a nine foot eight weight. And also they make a seven and an eight weight one piece or in that IMX series. So all really, really strong options there. If you're looking to spend a little bit more money and, and get into, you know, proper premium sticks, the NRX, as you mentioned, there is the new NRX plus is fantastic. Um, you'd be looking at the NRX plus S that's going to be the saltwater series. Again, built in the U S just really killer sticks. I, I actually just picked up uh, one. I'm supposed to be going to Cuba in a couple of weeks here with clients. So um, looking forward to getting that thing out there. And then obviously you have the G Loomis ask with, um, that's going to be, uh, offered in a six a seven and an eight, uh, would be kind of your small mouth sizes. I'd really look there at a seven, but, uh, great thing about Loomis. They're making three different options, three different price points, all really, really solid, solid choices. Um, and like I said, there's a lot of, a lot of cool stuff on the market right now. So great question there, Jason. And, uh, I said, definitely, uh, Check them out. If you guys have not been into the shop and seen any of the new uh, G Loomis stuff, 
definitely swing on by, give them a wiggle, give them a cast. It's uh, some really cool stuff on the market right now. All right, back to my other list here. So Bob from State College uh, asked about the Scott Centric new uh, new rod from Scott. So Scott just replaced the Radian a few months ago uh, with a brand new series called the Centric. Uh, super super nice rods. We've been selling them uh, pretty pretty consistently since we got them in. Um, I have not gotten a chance to spend much time fishing one yet, um, but as far as casting, uh, they've been very very nice. The nine five to me really stood out as the sweetheart of the whole group. Um, Really just a, a a pretty unique rod. Very similar, I would say, to the Radiance. A little lighter in hand, a little bit faster. Um, but at the same time, you know, uh, like I said, it's it's an update on a, a really solid classic. And I think that's one that, again, I would highly recommend you come on in and check them out. Aesthetically, they're very, very good looking rods as well. They did a nice job with the dark grays and black on the rod. A little bit of red accents here and there. Uh, Nick Fox, yo Lenny, can you comment on the best gloves or mittens for fishing in ultra cold climates? A uh, couple different options there, Nick. Um, Sims has a bunch of choices, as does Orvis have one new really, really nice choice right now. So for me personally, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, fold over mittens. So when you want, obviously, you can kind of fold them over uh, and treat it as a traditional mitten. And then when not in use, you can peel that back and you'll have half finger gloves across the rest. Uh, this year, Sims just released a brand new line of gloves. Unfortunately, due to COVID, they were backed up and we're just, we still haven't even seen them yet, unfortunately. But um, keep an eye out for those guys. It's going to be a whole new line of Gore-Tex Windstopper. It's called Infinium. It's a brand new laminate uh, from WL Gore and Associates. Really, really lightweight, 100% uh, windproof, very warm, uh, especially for the warmth to weight ratio. As I mentioned, they're, they're very light. Uh, and the really, really interesting thing is that this laminate won't, absorb water, at least not nearly to the extent of older Windstopper fleece pieces. So uh, really solid choice there, specifically if you're going to get things wet. Uh, like I said, I think to me, that's the best of both worlds, having one of those fold over mitts. Uh, they just allow you the ability to tie your knots and, you know, have some dexterity and actually have the ability to do what you're looking to do uh, when you're out there on the water, even in the cold. But when it's nasty, you can pop those mittens over, you know, walking A to B, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the new gloves from Sims uh, in their Gore-Tex Infinium Windstopper series would be uh, a, certainly a really solid choice. And then the other choice uh, would be the new Orvis Pro gloves. So same deal. They have a fold-over mitt. Uh, they have one that has a Primaloft insulation in it. Um, I've been wearing those for the last couple of months. Maybe I got them maybe two or three months ago. So I have, I'd say, maybe five, six, seven days on the water so far where I've actually worn them all day. But um, very, very good choice there. The one thing I will say about Orvis, they run a little big. So Sims, I wear large gloves and everything. Uh, Orvis, I would look at the medium and the pro. But those would be my two best kind of options uh, for ultra cold fishing. Again, the Orvis Pro fold over mitt with the Primaloft uh, insulation or the new Sims Gore-Tex Infinium Windstopper fold over mitt. Uh, right. Any other questions? I'm going to go back to my other list real quick, I guess. Let's see here. So we got another question here. Aaron from Reading is asking, is TCO providing guide trips this year? How do I get in contact with someone about that? So absolutely, we are guiding. Um, it's been a super strange year, as I mentioned, for everyone. But uh, we do have the ability to get clients out on the water. We're not running um, – large scale classes. Uh, we are still offering all of our normal beginner schools and beginner classes, but again, in a little bit smaller groups uh, and broken up a little bit more frequently to avoid some crowds. But as far as uh, getting out on the water, um, we've got a ton of guys still fishing, uh, a ton of our guides, obviously out on the water, still uh, taking clients fishing. So uh, if you're interested, give us a shout at any of the shops. Uh, you know, you're, if you're looking to get out in South Central Pennsylvania, do a little trout fishing, give Neil Sunday a call out there in Boiling Springs. Um, you know, you're looking for state college. There's a ton of really, really great fisheries up there and a lot of really fishy guys working in the shop too. Um, so we are offering guide trips. And like I said, if you're curious or interested, you want to get out on the water, let us know. I'm more than happy to do that. But really any of the shops will certainly be able to help you out with that. All right. Oh, and you're welcome, Nick. No problem. Thank you. 
Adam from Columbus, Ohio, had sent in a question asking about he's got a, a new uh, a new reel for tarpon. He's got a tarpon trip coming up. So Adam, I'm jealous. That sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of different options in the market as far as tarpon reels. Um, first and foremost is going to be dependent upon the, the the size that you're talking about. So tarpon come in a bunch of different sizes, obviously. You can go catch little baby tarpon that are going to be 6, 8, 10 pounds. You can land them on an 8 weight, no problem most of the time. Uh, on the flip side, you start looking at some fish pushing, you know, 150 plus pounds, then it's a very different program. My choices, I mean, tarpon, uh, they're a serious fish that's not a place where, unfortunately, you, you can't really skimp uh, on a good tarpon reel. Um, my favorites right now in that realm, I would argue, would probably be the Waterworks Lance and Cobalt series. Uh, they make that in both a 10 and a 12 weight size. Um, and there's a number of options there as far as both, you know, uh, like I said, size and, uh, and, and weight. If you're fishing like a 10 weight, you could probably put the 10 on there and be fine. And if you're fishing an 11, again, you can probably get away with a cobalt size 10. The 12 and above, uh, you definitely would want to jump into that cobalt. So that's uh, one of the reels I have. Certainly a big fan of that, that guy there. Um, a lot of options from Hatch. Certainly, certainly really nice as well. You've got the 9 plus or the 11 plus. And with various size arbors, you can really load those things up. And if you're looking for something maybe a little bit more budget-oriented, uh, the Hydro series from Orvis is not a bad choice by any means, uh, as would be uh, maybe some of the little bit lower-end lamps and pieces out there. So you'd have things like the the Guru, the Speedster, or the new Lightspeed actually is also a very nice reel as well there too. So a bunch of different options for tarpon reels, um, but kind of depends on how specific. <laughs> Uh, any new Costa frames for large heads? Yes, Jason, you do have a large head, and there are a number of new Costa options out there. So I actually just met with our Costa rep uh, two days ago and saw a number of new pieces uh, from Costa Del Mar sunglasses. So as uh, as you can see right here, I'm a huge, huge fan of Costa stuff. Own a number of pairs. Um, they make some of the lightest glass frames on average. They're you know 30% lighter than a lot of the competition. So most everybody uh, that we're dealing with in the stores usually ends up going with glass. And you'll have uh, at least a lot of different lens options there. However, uh, Costa is now releasing a brand new line of, they're calling them the Pro Series of uh, shades. So you'll have some updates as far as uh, the aesthetics and appearance of a lot of the really popular options like the Black Fin, the Fantail, um, things like that. Uh, but there's also two XL options now, I believe, one in the Spiro, and I think the other might be a Diego. I'd have to double check on there. But uh, yep, a lot of wide fit options, a lot of big head options, small head options. Uh, Costa's doing a really, really nice job with the, these new pieces, and I think they're going to be a, a really, really a nice addition to the lineup. So if you're looking for shades, definitely, again, come on by, give us a call, check out all the stores. We all have a pretty solid selection of Costa's with hopefully more on the way. So definitely some good choices there. How about any other uh, rods we want to talk about? We've got a couple new options going to be hitting the market here real soon. We'll have the new... A Winston Air 2 is going to be released in the next few weeks. They're going to start shipping. Um, so that's a pretty uh, pretty interesting new stick from what I understand. I honestly have not gotten hands on one yet, so looking forward to that. Um, but I believe that's about the, the, the main kind of upgrades or updates as far as uh, Winston goes. Sage, we've got a couple new rods just hit the shop actually today. Uh, the new Sonic series, it's going to be their mid $500 price point. So if you're looking to maybe upgrade or you're looking as kind of an extra quiver rod, you know, you already have your eight and your 10, maybe you want to throw a seven or a nine in the mix, something like that. That'd be a, again, a really good choice there as well. So definitely some new, uh, new sticks hitting the market right now. That's kind of fun. Kind of cool. All right. Let's go back to my other list of questions. Let's see. Jen from Montana had sent in an email about, uh, waiters for women what waiters are available for women on the market um a lot we're in a great time right now as far as fly fishing goes i've been telling customers over the last couple of years we are super lucky we're in the golden age of equipment there's more options as far as rods reels lines waders boots boats you know you name it uh, than there's ever been before um so the, some of the more popular options sims obviously has a number of different pieces uh, in our lady series uh, they'll have the tributary, the Soul River waders, it's going to be like your entry levels. 
uh, you'll have all the way up to the G3 uh, guide uh, zippered waders actually for, from Sims. They have a, a zipper system down the side here. It makes it a lot easier getting on and off, got to use the bathroom, whatever it may be. So those are some really popular choices from Sims. And Orvis also has, um, you know, three different options. They've got, uh, you start with the clear water, 200 bucks, and then you jump to the ultralights, and then also all the way up to the Orvis Ladies Pro waders. So a bunch of different choices out there for sure. Uh, Gary Kaufman, recommendation for smallmouth rod and line weight. Typically speaking, uh, myself, I like a seven for most of my smallmouth fishing applications. You can certainly go a little lighter, and you can certainly go heavier. Uh, I, a lot of that has to do with where you're at, the size class of fish you're seeing. So, for instance, for us in Pennsylvania, you know, we have, we're very lucky here. We've got a really nice smallmouth fishery in a lot of places. Most of our major rivers, the Susquehanna, the Junietta, the Allegheny, the Lehigh, the Delaware, blah, blah, blah. They all have a lot of bass in them. Now, certain times of year during the summertime, water gets lower, clearer, we're fishing smaller flies, uh, lighter tippet, et cetera. So maybe there you jump down into that six, seven weight range. On the flip side, we generally speaking are fishing more in the seven, eight weight range in that earlier season, higher water, bigger flows, bigger flies. So both of those would be pretty safe, or all, really all three, six, seven, or eight, dependent upon, again, what size class of fish you're going to be running into and also what size flies you think you're going to fish. If you're really looking to fish small poppers for little bass during, you know, later in the summer, uh, even a, a five weight could be okay for, again, bass to say 14 inches. If you're getting consistently into a little bit bigger bass, bigger water, uh, and again, bigger flies, I might think to, to jump up to a seven or an eight. As far as individual rods, I wasn't sure if you were actually asking there, but again, a lot of different choices out there. The G Lumis IMX Pro, again, is one of my favorites. It's not a, you know, a super crazy expensive rod. It's not, you know, $1,200, but um, I own a number of them. Uh, I fish a lot of them and, and they're very, very nice. So that would be a great choice again from Loomis, uh, looking to Sage. They have the new payload series. That's a streamer specific stick from those guys. That'd be a good one. Um, Orvis again, tons of options across the board really just depends on price point. So if you want me to get a little bit more detail there, Gary, just let me know for sure. I'd be more than happy to walk you through any of the rods. Uh, James Wilson, what do you recommend? A 10 foot three weight urinymphing rod. Again, kind of back to what I was mentioning before price point has a lot to do with it. You know, it is a gear sport and uh, we all do know that it certainly does add up some of the stuff. Um, so I'll give you three or really four, I guess, really solid options in my opinion for a 10 for three. So uh, if we're looking more entry level, uh, the Orvis Clearwater, they're $229. They make a 10 foot three weight. It's a four piece rod. Got a 25 year warranty, just like all of the other Orvis products. And for the money, that is, in my opinion, best bang for your buck in that $200 ish price point range. Uh, there's a lot of other really nice options on the market. Some of this stuff from Echo. We carry a lot of stuff from Reddington as well, like the new Strike. But in that similar price point, I personally tended to lean a little bit heavily, a little bit more heavily on the Clearwater. Uh, once you get up into the middle price point range, you know, in that five to six hundred dollar range, again, I would still stick with Orvis primarily. In my experience, uh, the Recon 10.3 is is fantastic for just over five hundred bucks. Again, built here in the United States. Uh, great warranty, great great piece of, of equipment there. And I would say in the higher end price points, the reason I said I guess I'll kind of give you four is uh, if you're looking strictly at a 10 foot three weight, my favorite on, on the market of any 10 three I've ever fished is the Sage ESN. Um, we sell a ton of them in the store. They're super light. They're very delicate. They're very, very sensitive. So that would be a really good choice. While Orvis doesn't offer a 10 foot three, they offer the Helios three and a 10 and a half three. Um, so again, not exactly to your question there, but, uh, that would be another really good choice. I, I own that rod as well. And I fish that quite a good bit. I like that if I find that I'm going to be on a little bit larger piece of water, say something more along the lines of say like, uh, the little Junietta or Penn's Creek, maybe not super high water. I don't know how familiar you are uh, there, but that's, uh, some of the, some of the trout streams that I fish in central PA They're you know, small rivers essentially. And that's where I like that little bit extra length at the 10 and a half footer. But, you know, if I'm just picking one size configuration, you're right on the money, I think with the 10 foot three. And again, dependent upon price point, if you're looking kind of good, better, best, I would recommend Clearwater, Recon, uh, both of those from Orvis. And again, at that top, I really do like the Sage ESN. I think that's probably about as good as they get in a 10 for three. So hopefully that answered that question. All right. Uh, 
uh, current spots, what rod and line would you recommend for streamer fishing local streams? I had a 10.5 or a Helios 2. Would that work? Absolutely. Um, if by local we're talking local to, to you know central or kind of Pennsylvania, let's say, for the sake of the argument, then absolutely. Yeah, I fish a 10.5 a lot. Uh, again, as I've mentioned, I, I reference central Pennsylvania quite a good bit because, uh, you know, I went to school up there at Penn State. I, I've spent a lot of time in the area fishing. So for me, I fish a 10-5 streamer fishing in those creeks a lot. A um, couple different options for sure out there as far as individual rods. But um, the Helios 2 is a great stick, and that would be more than sufficient for, I'd say, probably 90 plus percent of the streamer fishing we rec or that we kind of do around here. Now, as far as the line, that's where you start to run into some options. Uh, that has to do very specifically, I would argue, with kind of two factors. First and foremost would be uh, water flow. And secondly, my kind of second thing to, to think about would be uh, time of year and, and, and I guess really water temperature. So if the water is really cold like we have right now, I mean, obviously we've got, you know, nights down in the teens in much of the state. There I find myself fishing, you know, in those colder situations on average, I prefer a floating line with a heavier fly. Um, so you can fish in varying lengths of leaders, but a weighted fly with, um, you know, a, a floating standard fly line to me tends to allow me the most versatility. I can make a cast and I can really pinpoint accurately where I want to be, what I'm going to be doing. Um, and I can just keep those flies in that strike zone a little bit longer with a floating line and that heavier fly on the flip side, if you were to use, say, a sinking tip line and an unweighted or maybe lightly weighted fly, that certainly works very well on bigger pieces of water, bigger pools, deeper runs, where you have the ability to make a long cast to lay line on the water and actually fish the fly that way. Um, versus a lot of the creeks that I fish, you know, if I were to make that longer cast, a lot of times that water speed is so quick of the current that by the time my line is actually given a chance to sink. The flies are long past my intended target and, and destination. So it kind of depends. But for most of what we're talking, let's say for the sake of the argument, we're, we're fishing, you know, average size trout water in Pennsylvania, that 10-5 Helios 2 with a, a standard five weight floater on it, maybe a little bit more aggressive line, like a, an Orbis power taper or a, a, like a scientific anglers MPX taper. Both of those would be good choices. Give you a little bit more mass to turn over those streamers. Uh, and just affords you a whole lot of versatility. Again, sink tips have their time and their place dependent upon, you know, exactly where you're fishing and how you intend to fish. Full sinking lines, unless you're in a boat or plan to be fishing from a, a moving boat much of the time, I don't recommend full sinking lines for weight anglers in, in our fisheries here, typically speaking. So like I said, if that, you know, if you have any other questions, let me know. I'd be more than happy to follow up. Uh, I am history. Thoughts on these small boutique style rod companies like Moonshine Rods? It's a great question. Um, so I do not like them. I'm not a fan in the slightest for a variety of reasons. Um, I don't mean to be bashing any other products. They probably are, are, are just fine. And, um, you know, they'll, they'll work. Absolutely. There's no question about it. But in my experience, um, I've seen a couple things go wrong fairly consistently with those smaller boutique rod companies, like you said, uh, first and foremost. So let's say you've spent $500 on your moonshine rod. I don't know if moonshine is going to be around in five years when you break that rod. I've seen it happen far too many times with custom rod builders or these, again, smaller boutique companies. And many of them made some really good products. Clutch Fly Rods is a perfect example of that. There's a guy by the name of Lee Janik, started a fly rod company a number of years ago, I believe in Ohio. Uh, and he made some really, really nice fly rods. Uh, we never sold them in the store, but I fished with a number of them. I have a lot of friends who still own and fish them pretty heavily. The problem was, uh, you know, Lee started a small company and um, wasn't able to keep up with things. And, and unfortunately, they, they folded and went out of business. When those rods break, they're broken. Those rods were still $900, just like everybody else's, but they're gone. And, and there's nothing you can do about them, about fixing them. So to me, that's my usual kind of answer to anyone that's talking about, you know, whether that's a, a small boutique rod brand, like you said, Moonshine or, or the like, or uh, custom rod builders. Hey, like you said, if you want to go do it and support an, another brand, that's fine. But to me, I think you get a lot more bang for your buck in sticking with one of the larger, more established brands. Stick with someone who makes fly rods for a living and not takes blanks from, you know, a, a rod manufacturing facility overseas throw as much of uh, fancy wraps and labels and stickers and colors on it and, and makes it look good. Moonshine rods look beautiful, but if you've ever picked one up, you know, they do, do, don't, do not uh, fish or cast beautifully in my opinion. So um, again, uh, if given the choice, I would far rather take a, you know, a $200, you 
you know, Reddington or TFO or a lot of other options over a moonshine in my experience and opinion. So again, do, do we care what they look like or do we care how they fish? A little bit of both is fine. You know, you, you want uh, your rod to look good and you want nice aesthetics, but I'd rather focus primarily on performance. So, um, all right, moving on to that other list again. So, <laughs> okay, here's a funny one. What was the biggest fish you ever caught? Or even better. Okay, there you go. Neil Sunday. You tie with EP trigger point fibers. Absolutely. I would agree, Neil, for sure. Uh, so for those who are not familiar, EP trigger point is a synthetic winging material, is the way it was kind of marketed originally, um, made by Enrico Puglisi, EP uh, fly fishing. And to Neil's point here, he says the more he uses them, the more he finds ways to, to tie with them. So again, parachute posts, wings, tailing, bodies, all kinds of things. So the interesting thing about um, that product is that it's offered in a ton of colors. So you have the ability to tie, say, you know, uh, you can get a, a light pale yellow uh, EP trigger point fiber and just tie in uh, two or three or four strands of that and literally wrap that, uh, these long individual strands together to create your body. Uh, it looks cool. It looks different than dubbing, which is also, you know, in and of itself enough reason to use it, but, uh, it floats very well. Uh, trigger point is treated with a hydrophobic coating before it leaves the factory. So it, it floats very, very well. It holds no water whatsoever and it dries almost instantly. So to Neil's point, yeah, that's an absolutely, uh, great little product out there. It's being made in more and more colors, it seems every year. And, um, it, it's been really good for everybody uh, that's been using it both customers and employees in the shop. So yeah, it's great stuff and definitely a, a really, really unique little material. And using it in combination with other things too, Neil, that's something that you didn't necessarily mention. I love to do a lot of stuff where I'll use trigger point, maybe underneath a CDC wing or over top of, or mixed in with a deer hair wing. There's a, there's a lot you can do there. It gives it a, a cool look, gives you a little bit better visual cue to see it as well. So a, lo a lot that can can be done there. It's definitely pretty neat. Um, all right. So like you said, uh, someone asked a question, what's the biggest fish you've ever caught and how'd you catch it? The biggest fish I ever landed, it was a shark. Uh, I went out uh, with a, a friend years and years, a year ago. His father had a, a boat. We were chunking uh, and caught the big gigantic blue shark a number of years ago. So definitely a pretty, pretty unique experience. It was a lot of fun, but uh, not as cool as saying I caught some big, you know, billfish on a fly rod in Guatemala or Costa Rica, but definitely uh, still a good memory. I'm hoping to beat that. Everyone knows uh, if, you, if you've been around me in the shop recently, everyone knows I'm obsessed with tuna fishing right now. So I'm hoping to catch a big gigantic bluefin in the next year or two here. So that'd be awesome. All right. Let's see here. Uh, I also had another question from Jorge uh, asking about some of the new Sims packs. So for me, uh, packs are great. I will be honest. I am an old school guy. I love vests. I still wear a vest uh, just like uh, my dad and my grandfather and people before me as well. So um, I wear a Sims G3 guide vest. I've tried just about every vest option on the market. I feel like uh, Patagonia fish pond Sims over the years. Uh, and I just keep going back and settling on a bigger guide style vest for me just tends to work the best. Um, but as far as packs go, Sims is doing some really, really cool stuff with their waterproof series right now, the, the dry Creek line. Um, they've updated their zipper. If no one has seen it, obviously when the tie zips, you know, the big heavy, like they have on the Yeti cooler zippers first came out uh, and they were fantastic. We sold a lot of those packs, but if anyone's ever used them, you know, they're pretty hard to get in and out of relatively speaking. It's, you got to pull really hard on that zipper to unseat it. If the pull really hard on the zipper to seat it back again and keep it waterproof. So Sims is using a brand new zipper uh, technology this year where it's essentially imagine like the most heavy duty zip block bag connection you've ever used in your life. Uh, and it's great because there's no real chance of it failing as far as uh, the teeth getting broken or bent or, or moved. Um, if you do have a, a track failure where the zipper does separate and pop itself off, it's very easy. You just run the zipper all the way down and all the way back and it'll reset itself. Um, so in the, let's say they've been on the market for probably eight or 10 months now. Um, 
knock wood, have not seen anything come back. Uh, and everybody we've sold them to seems to be really, really happy and thrilled with those. So that's definitely something to check out if you're in the, the market for a new pack. I really, really am liking a lot of the, the waterproof stuff Sim's doing right now. Um, again, there's a, a number of new products that should hopefully be coming fairly soon here. Uh, again, supply chain has been a little little messed up. Uh, so certainly appreciate the patience of, uh, for anyone that's waiting on products for us um, and uh, and all that. So definitely some cool stuff coming down the pipeline. Just kind of stay tuned and, and stay patient. We'll, we'll get some stuff in your hands here soon, hopefully. All right. Let's see what else. Uh, the last question I had someone sent in beforehand looks like uh, just talking about a uh, dry fly hackle. So that's a common question we get in the store is, you know, hey, I want to get I'm, I'm new to tying. I want to get involved in tying some dries. So let's get the elephant in the room out of the way. Hackle is expensive. There is no two ways about it. There is no shortcuts. It's just an expensive product. Uh, it's pretty unique. Uh, obviously, genetically modified chicken feathers are not something that we see a ton of all the time. So it's, uh, you know, high demand, low supply, uh, and a lot of people looking for them. So Hackle, you know, a lot of different brands out there. I personally love whiting stuff, uh, and I like Mets stuff. In my opinion, whiting has the most consistent feathers. They're, they're also the most expensive. You are going to pay for it. Um, but lots of different sizes, options, you know, whether you're talking capes, saddles. Um, just for anyone who's not familiar, the difference between a cape and a saddle is uh, the cape is the front part of the chicken. So it starts up here in the neck and works its way down to the front of the rooster. The saddle is the rear portion of the bird. The capes will give you more variety in size. So up at the top by the neck, they'll be really, really tiny. You might have flies or feathers small enough to tie a 28 or a 30. And down the bottom, you're going to get into your big stuff where you'll get out of dry fly ranges up into, you know, a four or a two, just real big, wide, webby ha uh, half of feathers at the bottom. So if you're make, thinking about making your first investment into hackle, I would highly recommend you look into a cape. Uh, like I said, you'll have tons of feathers and a lot of size variety. Now, if you're a seasoned dry fly tire and you have been, you know, you've been accumulating capes all the time, uh, maybe it's time to start thinking about some saddles. So the trade-off between a cape and a saddle, they're, again, saddles are usually even more so expensive than a cape. Uh, but for two reasons, they give you on average far more usable feather. Uh, and a lot, a lot more uh, consistency in sizing. But while that sounds good, it also is far more limiting. Uh, so while you have a huge size range, like I said, from the biggest dry flies that are made to the smallest dry flies that are made on a cape, on a saddle, it's a much smaller range. So you might have the same enough feathers to tie a 10, a 12, a 14, and a 16, or maybe even a, just a 12, a 14, and a 16, or, or, or you know, somewhere in that range. It's usually only three or four sizes. So if you are a, a diehard midge fisherman and you love fishing tiny, tiny little dries, you can get a midge saddle where you know every feather is going to be really small. It's going to be your 18s, 20s, 22s, et cetera, where you can run through the same thing over and over. On the flip side, again, going back to a cape, you'll find that you'll get a lot more variety there. So uh, hackle is just, it's a little expensive. Like I said, it is an investment for sure. And it can be a little bit overwhelming and intimidating at first. So whenever you're thinking about making an investment or, and trying to get involved, uh, just let us know. Like I said, more than happy to walk you through, whether that's in person or over the phone or whatever it may be. Uh, gladly, uh, we're all here to help and point you in the right direction. So that's you know a rough little lesson on hackle. Gary Kaufman, uh, do you use strike indicators? And if so, what do you recommend? Absolutely, I use strike indicators. Absolutely. So um, back to, I guess, another question. We've had a, a couple of people talking about Euro rods, uh, and obviously that is the hip, hot new thing in fly fishing right now. European nymphing uh, is fantastic. There is a time and a place where it is by far the single most effective way to catch fish. Um, but it is not the silver bullet. Everyone thinks, oh, well, I read George Daniel's new book or I read Dom Swintowski's new article on Trout Bitten. I have to tight line and I have to get my 10th to three way. Uh, as someone who almost exclusively tight line nymphs, I'm not saying not to do that. I'm not saying not to, to learn and to, to try new stuff. But don't get pigeonholed in the fact that you have to tight line. There are times and places where strike indicators are not only useful, but in my opinion, they're almost a necessity. Uh, you will catch more fish in certain places, certain situations, using an, in, in, an indicator versus not. Um, so do I use strike indicators? Like I said, absolutely. What type do I recommend? Here comes the annoying part. There's a big but and if in everything uh, in fly fishing. So 
there are some choices that are great for certain situations and terrible for others. Um, in theory, most of the time, I carry around three different indicator styles on my person when I'm fishing. First and foremost is going to be an airlock. Um, so a lot of people have, you know, probably at this point messed around with the new airlock style indicators. That was an update to the thingamabobbers of years ago. So airlocks have a small channel in them with a little nut and washer on top of the, essentially just a little foam ball. You'll unscrew that little washer. You now have a little groove like this. You lay your leader in there and you screw the washer back down on top and it locks it into place. You can then adjust that. You loosen that washer, you slide it up and slide it down, up and down your leader very easily, kink it or lock it back into place. It will not kink your leader the same way that thingamabobbers do. So I love airlocks. I always carry them in two sizes. Um, 99% of the time if I'm trout fishing, I'm going to use the half inch size at the smallest one that they offer. Um, the Sometimes I will jump up to the three quarter inch, but that's pretty limited. That's usually big flies and big water. So again, maybe I'm fishing the Lehigh River up in the Poconos with big stone fly patterns in the springtime. Or maybe it's, uh, again, you know, late spring on Penn's Creek. We've got a bunch of rain and I need to use a little bit more weight to get down. I might switch over to that three quarter inch, but airlocks are definitely one style that I always carry with me. The second style that I always carry with me would be uh, the New Zealand strike indicator system. So it's essentially a yarn or wool style indicator. There's a lot of different ways to do it. You know, Pat Dorsey has been doing it for years with polypro macrame yarn and a little, you know, orthodontist band. You can throw that on there. That works very well. The New Zealand kit is a, about the same. It's a similar system utilizes a, a small piece of surgical tubing to essentially lock various sizes and amounts of yarn, or in that case, it's actually wool, uh, onto the leader. It's a little hard to kind of describe this way. So if anyone that's listening isn't familiar, you're curious, uh, just type in New Zealand strike indicator system. There should be a number of uh, videos and, and things online where you can see. But the thing I love about the New Zealand system, I guess there's really two things. First and foremost, it's incredibly sensitive. Uh, you can watch it you know, that indicator will literally just twit, tick and, and move its way down the creek as it touches ever so slightly, you know, your flies are ticking a rock or something. So it's really, really, really sensitive. So I love that. Uh, secondly, uh, it lands incredibly soft. So where do I make that differentiation going from a small airlock to a, a yarn or wool style indicator? That again has to do primarily with conditions. So if I'm fishing a small piece of water, let's say we're talking about like Valley Creek right here, uh, you know, 20 minutes from my house. Uh, if I'm fishing Valley on average, I'm almost never going to use an airlock style indicator. Even in higher flows, the creek's pretty small. The fish are pretty pressured and they're pretty spooky. So I found that something that lands a little softer on average will uh, be a little bit more effective for you. So the... Uh, you know, like I said, on lower water conditions, smaller flies, smaller fish, smaller amounts of weight needed to get you down to where you need to be. Uh, again, yarn, wool, that New Zealand style indicator system is great. Once you start getting into bigger water, deeper water, faster water for sure, then you can start switching back over to that airlock uh, style indicator. Uh, and then the last one I consistently use a fair bit is the pinch on style indicator. So it's essentially imagine a foam sticker with adhesive on the back of it. And you literally just pinch them together, you know, gluing your line in the middle of those two pieces of adhesive. They work really, really well, uh, just like the yarn. They land very soft. They're very, very sensitive. But I don't like them as much for two main reasons. First and foremost, you can't move them. So once they're on your leader, they're stuck in place. So if I know that I have 100 yards of water, of water in front of me where I'm not going to change my indicator very much, they're just fine. But if I know that, well, this run I need to be here, this run I need to adjust to here, this run I need to adjust to here as I'm working my way up, that means that I'm constantly having to rip off that little foam indicator, throw it in the bottom of my waders in my little pocket, put a new one on. So it's wasteful. Uh, so I don't love the one-time use uh, aspect of it and the fact that I can't change it and move it is a little bit more frustrating. But I usually keep at least a pack of them in there. There's a time and a place for them uh, as well. So when it comes to indicators, like I said, the main three things to think about match the size of your indicator to the conditions you're seeing. So if you're dealing with low clear water, very small flies, a small amount of weight, use the smallest indicator you possibly can. On the flip side, you're dealing with high water, dirtier water conditions, you need more weight, et cetera, et cetera. Switch back to a larger style indicator. Um, you know, going back to, again, I mentioned George Daniel a little while ago. George is Obviously, if anyone that knows, he's a master of nymph fishing and, and all types of fishing as well. But 
something that he focuses on very heavily and makes a lot of sense to me and really changed the way I look at indicator fishing is he's uh, uh, honestly obsessed is the only way to put it. He's obsessed with uh, balancing his indicators buoyancy to the amount of weight needed to uh, get down to the fish. So essentially what I'm trying to say is if I need a very small, small amount of weight, I want to use the smallest indicator possible, not just because of the delicacy uh, when it lays down on the water, but also from a sensitivity standpoint. If, if you think about it this way, I want that indicator barely able to suspend the amount of weight I have so that any little thing that happens, that indicator is going to go under. It is just barely holding on to the surface up there. So the closer you balance the amount of weight to your buoyancy of your indicator, the more uh, essentially the more sensitive that indicator system becomes. On the flip side, if you put on, you know, a giant balloon this big and you only put one tiny little split shot underneath it, it's going to take a ton of force to move that balloon. On the flip side to that, like I said, is if I put on, you know, a small, tiny little indicator and a split shot where it's just barely able to hold that split shot up, it's going to take very little, almost no force to get that indicator to react, whether that's to stop, pause, go under, go forward, etc. So uh, I know that was a little long winded, but. Hopefully that makes sense. Yes, we use strike indicators. Yes, there's a time and a place for them. And uh, like I said, the three, the three that I, I oftentimes recommend, think about picking which of those indicators based on the speed of the water, the depth of the water, and the amount of weight needed to get down to the fish. So hopefully that makes some sense for you. Um, let's see, any other questions? I think that was everything off of my pre-made list. Anybody else got anything for me here? Anything fun? Well, in the meantime, I guess we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll just talk a little bit about what's going on in the stores. So as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, for any of you who were maybe not here when I first started, uh, again, thank you very much for tuning in here tonight. And thank you very much, obviously, for uh, your support of the shop over the years, specifically over this past year. Uh, it's been a weird one. It's been a challenging one for everyone. So certainly, again, it's very, very much so appreciated. Thank you. Um, the other thing is uh, inventory, I guess. I'll, I'll make another note on that. It's been pretty challenging to get some stuff. Uh, it's a great thing in the long run for the fishing industry and for the fishing kind of world uh, at large. There's a ton of new people involved in the sport, a ton of people wanting to get outside and have fun with it. Um, but <laughs> we're dealing with, uh, like I said, a couple supply chain issues that are slowing us down. So if you're looking for something and you see it, I would jump on it. And uh, if you are still looking for something and you're not seeing it, just hang in there, stick with us. Be, you know, uh, at least we appreciate the patience and uh, we will certainly hopefully try whatever we can do to get that stuff into your hands as quickly as possible. So like I said, thank you very much for that. And uh, just a, a little note. You should like that a lot, Gary. That New Zealand system is very, very useful. Uh, like I said, it takes a little bit of kind of tinkering to get used to it first, but generally speaking, once you get the hang of that, it's a really, really effective tool. Uh, and like I said, don't neglect it. You can fish that one way upstream. I'll, I'll throw that 40, 50 feet up a run if I can afford to do it uh, You know, from a, a castability standpoint. And you just watch that thing just come back and whoop, just go right down. So it's a really, really nice system, and I think that you'll be pretty darn happy with it. Honestly, I tell people in the store all the time, I've been sitting on the same pack of New Zealand wool for over a decade. I got a, a sample pack when that company first started. They sent out some samples to us here at the shop and said, if you guys are interested, just check out our product. And literally goes to show you, I think 11 years later, uh, roughly, I am still fishing the same tool, the same pack, and I still use it all the time. It's a great, great system. So highly recommend anyone who hasn't jumped on that like Gary has to, to think about it. At least it's, you know, so $15 well spent. For sure. All righty. See any other questions? Um. Well, I think that's uh, that's about all I've got here. Like I said, I'll leave it up to you guys for a couple more minutes. See if anyone else is. Oh, one other thing to note. One other thing to note. If you guys have not heard, um, cicadas. Cicadas, cicadas, cicadas. You're going to hear a lot about cicadas in the next couple of months here. So um, this year uh, we have the Brood X event. So obviously for those of you who do not know, we have both, you know, standard every year, good old fashioned normal cicadas that hatch and we hear them and we see them all over, you know, uh, when we're out fishing and see them in the yard, et cetera. 
Every 17 years, we have what's called a periodical cicada hatch. So every 17 years, we have a mass emergence of these bugs. Um, if you're curious about learning in, about any of that stuff, just type in uh, brood X cicadas, X meaning like Roman numeral 10. Um, the broods are broken down. You'll see some really cool maps online. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of info coming out from us and from others uh, on this as, as, as to how it pertains to fishing. So keep an eye out for that stuff. Um, but we're going to see a ton of that stuff in the southeastern and south central part portion of the state. Uh, it's going to swing up along the Susquehanna and the Juniata rivers. So we're going to have some really cool smallmouth fishing, uh, again, a once in a 17 year cycle kind of, kind of fishery. So definitely, uh, get to tie in, stock up on your foam, stock up on your rubber legs. And, uh, like I said, know that we'll have hopefully a whole bunch of cicadas coming. If you've never fished a cicada hatch, you, you've got to see it one time. It's a really cool, kind of, you know, Nat Geo type event where there are a lot of bugs around and everything eats them. Birds, squirrels, chipmunks, fish, deer, you name it. If it's walking around outside, it's going to try to eat these things. They just know that there's a ton of food and a ton of protein available to them. So I think uh, this year could be a really interesting year. We've been talking in the shop about it's going to be the year of the terrestrial between lantern flies, between periodical cicadas, uh, and between our typical ants, beetles, crickets, hoppers. I think this uh, late spring and early summer is going to be a really good kind of terrestrial trout fishing season for us and uh, hopefully also give us some uh, some good opportunities to get into some really cool warm water fisheries this summer, carp, bass, et cetera, et cetera. So brood X, cicadas, do a little reading, do a little research, reach out to us directly at the shops, uh, all four stores. We're, we're all going to see it to some certain extent, really Reading, Boiling Springs, and down here uh, in, in the main line area, or we're going to see a little bit heavier than they are up in State College. But uh, again, a lot of a lot of cool stuff to look forward to uh, for the summertime. Another another reason to look forward to warm weather after the, the this weekend of weather we're about to have here. So I I agree, Aaron. Uh, catching carp on foam cicadas is some of the best fun you'll ever have with fly rod. It's uh, it was one of those things I did not think I was going to be a big fan of carp fishing until they start exploding things on the surface like that. It's a really, really cool fishery. Um, and the last go around, I got to be honest, I was I was pretty darn young. I didn't really know what I was doing 17 years ago, nearly the extent I do now. So really looking forward to getting out there and uh, getting after it pretty heavily. So definitely a, a great point. Like I said, carp is a an underrated species of target in general in some ways. And definitely when you start looking at the cicada program, they really like them. So that's, that's a great point. Uh, let's see here. I think, uh, I think that's about all I have here, folks. So like you said, I'll uh, leave it open for a few more minutes here and see if anyone else has anything they'd like to ask or add or chime in. But Again, uh, I said thanks for tuning in, folks. And uh, while we can't be, you know, like I said, running around the the, the fly fishing shows this year, uh, hopefully this was at least, uh, you know, a little bit of a reprieve from the Groundhog Day we've been having here. So, again, thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in. And, uh, again, appreciate all the support over the years, myself uh, and the entire sh entire company. Uh, there you go. <laughs> Neil's got the carb spot. And thank you very much, Gary, for the, the questions. Thank you for participating, folks. Uh, like I said, hopefully if this was enjoyable for you guys, let us know, please. Uh, leave a comment, like, subscribe, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, you know, shoot us an email. Shoot myself an email. Just Lenny, L-E-N-N-Y, at tcoflyfishing.com if anyone has any questions. Um, again, I'm down at the Bryn Mawr store, or excuse me, Haverford store now. Um, Give us a give us a call. Stop on by. Say hi. I'd like to see everybody out there. And uh, again, thank you very much for tuning in. If you've got any other questions, anything else you'd like to hear from us, let us know. And hopefully we can do this again soon. So everybody stay warm out there. Stay safe in the snowstorm coming up this weekend. Hit the vice. Get ready. And uh, spring will be here before we know it. So again, thank you very much, everybody. And have a good night. Thank you as well. All right. All right, cool. Thanks, guys.